Good morning. So, starting out on the second day, the weather has dawned a cracker day. However, uh, the rest of the island is pretty rough, so probably won't be able to make our way up north, um, which is a bit of a bummer. We'll be stuck here in the pass, but that's all good. Feeling a bit dusty after a few shandies and beers last night, so we're going to have a cruisy morning, big breakfast, and then go and try uh, maybe the mussel farms and spat farms and uh, get into it. As you could probably tell from that, I was a bit dusty, but we got our suits on, got underway, headed across the bay, and nothing like a quick dip to get you going in the morning. And on one of the first drops down, probably around 14 to 16 metres, I was greeted by this absolute shonker of a monkey who, because of the distance, I didn't quite gauge how big he was until the shot and the reel started buzzing. And the fight was on. Seeing that the spear was good, I grabbed the line, stop it going any further, and just skull dragged him up to the top. It was easy, it wasn't like a kingfisher or anything, but still a surprise to have a fight back from a blue mocky. A few more drops didn't show anything better than that, so we decided to move on and left, heading to the spat farm. But there's nothing worth showing over there, no fish around, but I will show you this trick if anyone's interested. It's a great way for sashimi to get them tender straight off the bat from catching it. Open the spider, and find the spinal cord. Piece of mono, three of them. Piece of mono down the spinal cord. You can watch it as it loosens its muscles as the mono goes down. Have the best sashimi out. With no success on the muscle or spat farms, we headed out and around past Paddock Rocks to go and try a spot that had been pretty successful in the past. Dropping straight down showed me a great school of teraki there, and even a few trevally which the guys on the boat managed to catch, which I asked them to keep for sashimi later that night. But, of course, my favourite, the blue mocky were around, so they swam too close and had to go. And ended up landed in the chilli bit. Having seen a few flickers of snapper over in the distance, I went down with my masher and burlied up some kinna. Once you moved off the rocks where I was, it had a sort of coarse sand bottom, and a few goatfish came up feeding, which was quite cool to see. The little protrusions underneath their chin are where they get their name goatfish, and they use them to hunt for prey in the sand. They're found in depths down to about 100 metres, and, most interesting of all that I think, they can change their colours in chameleon-like ways to blend in or display themselves, which is pretty cool.
After grabbing a few more blue mocky off camera, we got out and had a well deserved lunch, heading to the next spot. Jesse took the first dive on the new spot, but came up empty handed. I got a few drops in myself before doing the standard aid to the boat people, unhooking snags from the bottom. It's always handy to have a free diver that can get to the bottom. After not getting too much interesting on the bottom, I decided to borrow the boat's burley, shake it up, as I'd seen a few snaps flicking past in the distance. Drifting with the burley trail got me my first monster snapper in the Nelson Bays. And man, I have to say, I'm glad that I've been gymming it recently and had the forearm and bicep strength to hold on to this beast. And yet somehow my friends on the mm. boat weren't in awe of my spectacular efforts. Could you make sure it's 25? <laughs> How big is the monster? What size is this one? 25. A strong 29. Woo! Monster! She's a monster! That's, that's four centimetres bigger than it needs to be, mate. I'd held off shooting my first snap of the ages hoping to get a shonker, but having only seen panties and holding off shooting them, I thought I'd have a bit more fun shaking the burly and seeing what came in the trail. And again another monster! And yet there seemed to be some shade of humour from the guys on the boat. I don't know why. Another measure of release. Oh no, it's at least 30. It's a monster. You sure it's gonna fit the chili one? Strong 29. Woohoo! And I am a man of my word, and they sure did. After that, we headed back with a good chili bin of fish to be divided by us all. I am stuck. We tried a couple more spots, but nothing interesting or worth showing. And as I'd been planning, I made everyone a sashimi platter using kahawai from the previous day, blue moki, teriki, trevally, and a little bit of snapper. And it was delicious. But not for everyone. Just for you, yeah. boss. Just for you. Another night of fish for dinner, a few beers, and a good sleep. And we're up in good time packing and cleaning the batch to get out on the water for the last fish before heading home. The spot we went to was about 18 or 20 metres and had a pretty good current to it. But I'd had good luck in an area like this before where the bank sort of dropped down into the main channel of French Pass. But that proved later to be a pretty fatal error when I was loading the gun. This happened. Despite having a spear on the boat, I thought I'd just go with the roller cranked all the way up to full tension and it would be fine if I saw any big fish. Then, dropping down to about 18-20 metres, I saw this. I've zoomed in because it's a little hard to see, but I estimate it's somewhere between 20 and 25 kilo. I had to decide quickly in the moment if I was going to rely on it coming back for a second pass to look at me, or just take the shot I could. 
The spear struck, which you can hear from the wheel running, but quickly came out, not having enough power to penetrate. And how did that make you feel, Mike? <coughs> After internally kicking myself for decisions made, because hindsight is really easy to know what I would have done, I went back to the boat where the captain had got a snag, so I went to investigate and found this. Pretty cool, one of the cod had been severely victimised by some carpet sharks, but the other was actually a keeper, so I unhooked them and left the untangling to the guys on the boat. But then, a strange turn to the day. We got a phone call from the friend of ours, whose batch we were using, asking if we were alright, because he had heard that there was a white boat sinking off Paddock Rocks. Do you see that boat out to your left? Despite having our radio on, Channel 16 hadn't repeated it to us, and realised that we were actually the closest boat. We didn't hear the call, but just went off what our friend told us. He also told us the nearest boat was a Sea Lord's one, and it was about 45 minutes away. Jumping up on the edge of the boat, I saw a flare in the distance, and we headed over. Sadly, the camera had a little bit of condensation, so it's not the clearest footage. But as we got even closer, they set off a smoke as well. It turned out that an automatic drainage valve had failed under the waterline, and they had swamped the boat trying to get it up on the plane and killed their engine. If one of them had stopped bailing, then the boat would have sunk. If it had been a choppy day, it also would have sunk. When we arrived, the transom was only about six inches above the water. We got them under tow, which drained a lot of the water to the back, allowing them to more quickly bail it. There we go. That's a bit easier than bailing. Not long after that, the Durval Ferry arrived, so we switched the tow over to him as he had a pump on board. After that excitement, we went back to the batch, collected our stuff, and began the journey to head back home. Would have just taken them to run out of the pump and stop As we arrived in French Pass, we saw the rescued vessel pulled up on the beach now, and safe from being sunk. And after a fantastic trip and good memories, it was home time. Hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers for watching. Subscribe, share it with your friends. Have a good one.